If you're interested in the history of radio and electronics, you probably noticed that early devices were ingenious and complicated electromechanical designs. There wasn't much there in terms of electronics because not much was known or invented yet, at least when we're thinking of electronics in modern terms, but mechanics behind them was astounding. One of such devices was an Alexanderson alternator. Invented in 1904 by Ernst Alexanderson and used since 1910, it was capable of transmitting a keyed continuous wave continues as opposed to a string of dumped waves produced by earlier spark gap transmitters, or CW in short, and was used to transmit transocean radio telegraphy messages using Morse code. Mind you, that 1904 was the year in which the simplest of vacuum tubes, a diode, was invented. The world had to wait 40 more years for the invention of a transistor. That's why Alexanderson alternator doesn't use even vacuum tubes. They were simply not invented yet. One transmitter using the Alexanderson alternator was built in Grimton in Sweden, in 1922 to 1924, and thanks to wonderful people at the Alexander Association, is still kept operational and transmits messages twice a year, on Alexander Sunday, Sunday at the turn of June and July, and on Christmas Eve morning. It's also operated during various events like World Radio Day. This transmitter, known by its console in SAQ, uses a very low frequency, VLF, of 17.2 kHz. Of course, electromagnetic waves can't be heard directly, but if it were a sound wave, then some people would be able to hear it. It's just above the hearing threshold for many, and modern sound cards are capable of directly sampling signal of such frequency. It's worth noting that a similar transmitter was built in 1922 in Babice in Poland, but it was destroyed in 1944 during World War II. There are a few different ways to receive signals at such low frequency. You could use a fairy throat antenna, like the one used in long-wave radio receivers, and maybe one day I'll build such receiver. You can't really use a full-size receiving antenna like a half-wave dipole unless you can build a 9 km long structure, but you can use a very short antenna so short that it doesn't really act as an antenna, but more as a capacitively coupled e-field probe. Fortunately, the signal is strong enough that it can be detected with modern electronics, sampled directly with a PC's sound card, and processed digitally. Some people just connect the e-field probe to the microphone input of their sound cards and report some effects. My first receiver was a simple design using a very sensitive 3 fm 2 ampere op-amp as a voltage follower, biased with a 1 giga ohm resistor, and connected to the line input of a sound card via a separating transformer. It worked, but it wasn't efficient. It mostly received 50 Hz hum and its harmonics, and of course radio waves generated by kinds of electric motors used by my neighbors. I could hear the neighbor using an angle grinder and see the fluctuations in a received waterfall. The band wasn't also filtered on the upper side, so the receiver was capable of feeding signals at frequencies that were too large for the sound card to sample and represent digitally. If you sample the analog signal at frequency f, then you can uniquely represent only frequencies up to f divided by 2. This is known as the Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem, and the maximum frequency that can be uniquely represented at a given sampling rate is known as the Nyquist frequency. If you sample the signal with a frequency above the Nyquist frequency and look at the spectrum of it, you'll see that the band sort of folds itself. The signal looks to have a different frequency that it really has. This phenomenon is known as frequency folding or aliasing. The biggest issue was that the magnitude of a VLF signal from SAQ was way below the 50 Hz hum. I was still able to filter and receive it digitally but it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to use a full dynamic range of my sound card, not only a small fraction of it. That's why I decided to design a completely new receiver designed specifically to receive the part of the band where SAQ transmits. The circuit is split into four logical blocks, a PSU, a front-end, a filter and an indicator. PSU block is boring, just 78L09 with some capacitors, so I won't go into details here. Front-end is built on a TL072 dual op-amp. It turned out that I don't need the more expensive ultra-sensitive op-amp that I used in previous designs. TL072 is cheap and sensitive enough to receive signals from a wire tied to a tree. First op-amp forms a front-end and the second one is used as a peak detector for an indicator. In retrospect, I could have added the capacitor between pin 3 of IC2A and ground to create another filter just before the first stage, but it doesn't seem to be really needed because the signal isn't large enough to overdrive its input and the filter in the feedback loop of IC2A is sufficient. So, the front-end block has two outputs, one for the filter and one for an indicator. Indicator is built around a LM393 dual comparator. 
The idea is to light up the green LED when the signal level is too low, red LED when it's too high, and both when it's just fine. Signal level can be set by setting the gain of the front end op amp with clear one. Filter block is done on a quad TL074 op amp. First stage is a second order high pass filter built in a salon key topology with a cutoff frequency of around 3.4 kHz. Here is the formula. Second stage is an amplifier to amplify the weakened signal after all high pass filtering. Remember that we'll drink with a strong 50 Hz hum that we want to get rid of. Next two op amps form a fourth order low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of around 34 kHz. Here's the prototype. I also experimented with a filter built on an LM324 op amp, and that's when I learned about the crossover distortion. Link explaining this nasty phenomena is in the description. And here's how it all looked like during assembly. After the signal finds its way to a computer, I use the VLFRX Tools Toolkit to receive SAQ. It's a great set of command line programs for digital signal processing that can be joined piped together to do various things. First I capture signal from a sound card and timestamp it with VT card. Then I both record it with VT write and if I'm around, because sometimes I can't be present when SAQ is transmitting so I just set up cron jobs to start and stop recording on a given time, use my VT Live's ground program to monitor the band in real time. Here's an example, it's not SAQ. After the signal is recorded, I play with it to extract the audio signal. Steps that I usually do. 1. Use VTread followed by VTS gram to produce a spectrogram of the whole recording and detect when SAQ started and stopped transmitting. 2. Use VTread again, but giving it a start position and time to extract. 
but here's the example. 3. Use VT filter to perform band pass filtering and silence out the portion of the band I'm not interested in. For example, to use a 50Hz wide brick wall band pass filter centers on 17.2 kHz. Here's the example. 4. Use a multiplicative mixer with a built-in local oscillator, VT mode, to generate local oscillator signal and mix the incoming signal with it, producing a pair of in-phase and quadrature components. For example, to mix with 16.8 kHz frequency to obtain a 400 Hz difference. Here's an example. 5. Use an additive mixer, VT mix, to extract the upper side band from these IQ components. I use minus C1, period minus J, so the result is. Here is the formula for it. So it's the exact copy of the in-phase component added to the quadrature component delayed by 90 degrees. So the upper side band stays and lower side band is cancelled out. Don't worry if you don't understand it. At least you have a life. 6. Use VT resample to resample the signal to 8 kHz. Larger, bigger bandwidth is not needed. All I have there is a kit 400 Hz signal. 7. Use VT route to apply final gain and convert VT string to wave file. And here's the example. And that's how the final result sounds like. After passing it through remorse, a tool I wrote to recover a clean Morse code signal from a non-perfect audio recording in South Seaman better. If you watched it to the end then you're probably at least somewhat interested in Morse code. I created a channel where I post jokes in Morse code sent by me, usually using a straight key. It's simply called Jokes in Morse code. Be sure to check it out. Link is in the description. Be sure to visit links in the description. Thanks for watching.